Happy New Year, people. Just before Christmas, we saw the release of Darktable 4.6. It came with a new module and a whole bunch of tweaks and improvements. In this video, we're gonna look at about a dozen of them. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 135 of Understanding Darktable. My goal is to devote no more than one minute to each of these. <laughs> Let's see how we go. Number one, something I wasn't even aware of. In previous versions of Darktable, the editing history, as you were working on an image in the Darktable, was not written to disk in real time. I thought it was, and maybe that's just a case of the fact that the app is so stable. I think in the eight years I've been running it, I've only seen it crash twice. That, you know, you just assume that it, stuff's happening all of the time and it's writing to disk all of the time. That was not the case, but now it is. There is a new preference, which you will find under the storage tab which says auto save interval 10. What that is, is every 10 seconds, your editing history is being written to disk. If you, for some bizarre reason, don't want it written to disk, you can set that to a value of zero and that will stop it from automatically updating your XMP file every 10 seconds. And presumably it will then only do it when you either move to another image or you leave the darkroom. Number two is the new module RGB primaries. Now, I will confess, I've not yet done any research on this module to learn exactly what the sliders are doing. I can work it out, but I, I wanna do a bit of research and I will do a dedicated video on the RGB primaries module. It'll most likely be the next video that I do, but basically it's a channel mixer. So if we have a look at the reds in this image, which would be all of the lit area down there on the ship, we can, change the saturation and we can change the hue of those reds. Uh, obviously, if we were to change greens and blues, there'd be less of an impact on those lights. But if we change the blue, that should affect the swimming pool area. So we can see that we can mess with the the hue and the tint of the of the blues. Like I said, I need to do a bit of research on this and I will do a dedicated video on it. So that's the new RGB primaries module. Number three is the Groundhog Day primaries panel, which has been added to the Sigmoid module. Now, the guy who wrote it, who goes by the name of Flannelhead on pixels.us, has put up this post introducing primaries feature for Sigmoid, which I will link to down below. If you want to read up, he goes right into it in great detail. I need to read that again. I sort of skimmed through it, but I do need to cover it again to really wrap my head around what's going on here. He does say, don't think of this primaries panel at the bottom of the Sigmoid module. It's just this little panel that expands. Don't think of it as being the same as RGB primaries. It's a slightly different beast and he goes into the technical side of why. Like I said, I've got some reading to do and if I can wrap my head around it, I will then do a dedicated video on it. That's number three. Number four, Liquify and Retouch will now both use pixels which are outside of the cropped area of the image. So if we have a look at the crop for this image, you can see that I've cropped it to a 16 by nine format and all of these pixels at the bottom are no longer part of the composition. So if we now go over to Liquify and we turn that on, you can see this light gray box, which now represents the cropped area of the image and then shows you any pixels that have been cropped out. And what you can now do is go, okay, I wanna do a, a big morph like so. And as you can see, pixels that are outside the cropped part of the image will now be used to apply that liquify effect. And the same goes for retouch. If, if I was to go into retouch and I wanted to do, you know, something like that, I can now clone from outside of the cropped area of the image. So that is the changes to retouch and liquify. Number five, for this one, just hold the clock. 
For this one, I've turned off OpenCL. Uh, so I've gone into preferences, processing, deactivated OpenCL support, and I'll re-enable that once we finish this part of the video. Okay, roll the clock. With pan and zoom, it takes a little minute, particularly if you don't have a good graphics card, for Darktable to generate a preview of the image that you're currently working on. And what I might do for this is go and add something like diffuse and sharpen, because that's very... Uh, processor intensive. So we'll just go with a lens D blur, something like that. Now, right at this point in time, this entire zoomed in view has been generated in high res. But you'll notice that if I pan across, part of the image wasn't in high res straight away, and it took a little while to to rebuild. Now what used to happen was that Darktable would calculate that entire view all over again in high res, even though part of that frame was already in high resolution. And that's the tweak, is that now it doesn't need to redraw the whole frame, it only needs to redraw the part of the frame that isn't currently in high resolution. So that's number five. Number six, long import routines can now be cancelled before they have finished. So if I go add to library and maybe I just want to go my commercial work 2013 folder, which has, oh, that's only got 69 images in it. Let's look at 16. There we go, 1600 images. If I go add to library, you'll see that there is now an X at the right hand end of this uh, progress bar and that will allow us to terminate that import before it has actually completed. To be honest, I thought you could do that in the past, but maybe I'm confusing it with something else. But anyway, you can now cancel or terminate a long import session before it has completed if you need to. That's number six. Number seven, you can now visualize a raster mask from the module that is leeching off some other module's mask, if that makes sense. Hopefully you understand what a raster mask is. So in this example, I have a mask on the tone equalizer module. If for example, I let's say we wanted to go to the local contrast module and I said, I wanna use a raster mask and I wanna use the mask that was on the tone equalizer, I can do that. So it used to be that you couldn't view this shape, which is the mask, because it didn't belong to this module, the local contrast module. Because you were sort of leeching off of a mask from another module, you had to go to that module if you wanted to see the mask or go to the mask manager. So that's a, a new tweak. So that's number seven. Number eight, you can now turn on highlight reconstruction for non-RAW files. Now, if you're shooting in JPEG, I don't know why you would bother turning on the highlight reconstruction module because in my experience, it's never gonna do anything useful on a JPEG. But just to demonstrate, highlight reconstruction, we will turn this on and you can have a look at what it deems to be the clipped areas. You can you know, change that, but really, I don't feel like it's gonna do anything useful to the majority of JPEG images. If you have some luck with it, great, uh, but just be aware that that is now a thing. You can turn on highlight reconstruction for images which are not shot in RAW format. That's number eight. Number nine is a tweak to the film strip view in the darkroom module. And it is that you can now use the control key and your mouse wheel to zoom the size of the film strip. And you can use your shift key to accelerate the moving of the film strip. So if I just use my mouse without a modifier, that is how fast the film strip moves. If I hold down shift, you can see that I can zoom all the way to either end of that catalog with one tweak of my mouse wheel. I don't know what you call that, one, one roll of my mouse wheel, I don't know. But yeah, so holding the shift key will accelerate the movement of the film strip. That's number nine. 
Number 10 is a tweak to the way multiple paths are shown in the mask manager. So if I was to just go in here and let's just randomly create a couple of paths. So I will go a path around the building like so, and maybe I'll do another one that, I don't know, maybe goes around this tree for example, something like that. So we've got two masks which intersect. If you go into the group, so don't look at the individual paths, but actually expand the group for this particular module, you've got your Venn diagram icon to show you that path two is in union mode, but you now have these indicators with a check mark to show you exactly what that mode is if you don't understand what the Venn diagram is actually telling you. If you didn't know that that little binocular like icon actually means union mode, then you could right click on that path and you would see from here that it's a union type uh, intersection. Well, not intersection because the next mode is intersection. Uh, so now I've changed that and you can change it to difference. And you can see each time that the Venn diagram updates, but this way you can actually see which mode you're in. So that is number 10. Number 11, there are two new entries on the list of search criteria in the collections module, and they are camera and lens. So if I'm looking at this collection of my images from Alaska, I could go narrow down the search and I wanna go by lens and I can see that I, really only use three lenses on that trip. Uh, the 263 that are unidentified were my manual focus wide angle lens. But if I just wanted to see all the images I shot with the Tamron 150 to 500 lens, I can just double click that. And there's all of my keeper images that were shot with that particular lens. Same goes for camera. So if you were shooting with multiple cameras and you just wanted to see images from one particular camera. You could choose camera as your search criteria. And as I can see, everything was shot on my a7 III. That is number 11. Number 12 is generate thumbnails in background. If you go to preferences and light table and thumbnails, you will see generate thumbnails in background. I've set mine to 1080p. Now, the interesting thing is that the tooltip says double click to reset to never, meaning that the default value is meant to be never. But if you double click, you'll see that it actually defaults to 5K resolution. So I think the intent was that it should be set to never as the default, but somewhere along the line, someone has made it default to 5K and not realized, or they made the decision to change it and then just didn't update the pop-up text, one or the other. But anyway, just be aware that you need to set that to whatever resolution you're happy with for your thumbnails. I set mine to 1080p and yeah, seems to work fine for me. So that is number 12. Number 13, there are two new defined variables uh, in the variables page, which you can find on the Darktable website. All of these variables can be used for renaming purposes and things like that. The two new ones are crop factor and focal length equivalent. So if you're shooting APS-C, that is your sensor size, uh, then you know if you're on a Sony, it's a 1.5 crop factor. If you're on Canon, it's 1.6. So you can use those variables either for renaming or you might want to include those in the text that appears down the bottom here in the darkroom view. I've added file name and file extension so that I can always see the file name that I'm working on, but you might want to put crop factor in there just to give you, you know, that information. It's up to you. That is number 13. Number 14, the ability to change the chroma subsampling level applied when you export a JPEG. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure how valuable this is. In the testing that I've done, it didn't seem to save that much disk space. So if I export this at full resolution, the default is Chroma subsampling 4.2.0. Uh, let's just go 444, because that's gonna be the highest quality. We'll export that. I've set this to create unique file name, so I don't need to worry about that. And if I then go to 420 and export that, 
and then if we look in my pictures temp folder there they are okay so there's a reasonable saving i guess from 9.3 meg down to 6.7 megs so you would only use this if you were comfortable to throw away a little bit of color information do your own testing is what i'm saying try and export at 444 try and export at 420 see if you can tell the difference if you can't tell the difference maybe 420 is good enough that is number 14. okay bonus tips number 15 this is for mac users only and it is for copy and paste you should now use your command key not the Linux style control key on your keyboard. I don't fully understand that because I'm not a Mac user and I don't have a Mac keyboard. I do know that Mac uses the command key where Windows and Linux use a control key. Um, so just be aware that that has changed. And number 16, the last one, again for Mac users, Darktable now only supports the versions of Mac OS that Apple supports. So for Darktable 4.6, that means you need to be on Mac OS 12.5 or later. If you are still running a version of Mac OS that is earlier than 12.5, you won't be able to run Darktable 4.6. All right, people, that is my summary of the list of new features for Darktable 4.6. There is a whole lot more in there. I've tried to cover the stuff that I felt was going to be relevant for the majority of users. Obviously, the last two Mac only. Yeah, I don't know how much of the Darktable audience is on Mac. I suspect that the majority of users are on Linux. But anyway, I've, I've tried to focus on the stuff that I thought would be most useful to your average user. There are a bunch of other things included in the release notes. I will put a link to the release notes in the description down below so you can check the full release notes out if you want to. Uh, but those are the things that I think were the things that you're going to encounter the most often and will have the most, you know, day to day impact on your image processing. All right. As I said, I do need to do a little bit of reading about uh, both the primaries panel in Sigmoid and the RGB primaries module. That's my homework for the next week. And uh, one of those two will be the next video that I do. Uh, questions, comments, sing out down below. You know where to find me. And I will catch you in the next one.